This program contains dramatizations, all scenes are from original Spanish records and Native American oral histories. Fifteen forty, Francisco Vazquez de Coronado chasing rumors of gold. Your hands will get filled with riches. Seven golden cities just over the horizon. This mission is Christian and apostolic, not a butcher. Dreams turn to dust. They're wondering, are they going to make it back alive? Supplies are running short. This was how the Spaniards would behave if you crossed them. A defiant people. The Indians killed 50 or 60 horses and pack animals. I have determined to suffer every disaster before abandoning this enterprise. It was a bad wind blowing in Pueblo country. The conquest of the Southwest. Is it true that you committed brutality, injuries, and outrages against the persons and property of the Indians of the towns through which your party passed? I do not know that any individual in my army perpetrated any brutality against the natives or their property. <laughs> Did you order the Indian called the Turk to be killed? Who ordered the killing and for what reason was it done? And were you present in the camp when the Turk was garroted? Francisco Vazquez de Coronado, age 34 commander of the first European expedition to the American Southwest, now on trial on charges of unnecessary cruelty. Vázquez de Coronado came to Mexico from Spain at age 25 to try his luck in the New World. It's frequently said about the age of exploration that what motivated people to go out and explore was the quest for God, glory, and gold. Coronado was typical of the ambitious young Spaniards of his day, men called conquistadors. What they were hoping for was through the use of arms, which was traditionally associated with nobility in Spain, to get the privileges that were associated with nobility, which was to have people serve them. Columbus landed in the New World in 1492, but it was Hernán Cortés in 1521 who showed that conquest could be incredibly lucrative. Cortez had started out a relatively impoverished member of the soldier class in Spain. He goes, conquers the Aztec Empire, is fantastically wealthy, and in fact gets a title of nobility. And lo and behold, a few years later, Francisco Pizarro follows legends of a land of Peru, discovers the empire of the Incas, which is actually even more wealthy than the Aztec Empire, and he manages to conquer it. And of course, between these two, they set up kind of a conquistador gold rush to uh, find even more of these empires. Vazquez de Coronado comes to Mexico as part of that rush, hoping to get wealthy by helping Spain acquire new territory. He is a trusted associate of the Viceroy of Mexico and rises quickly in the colony. He marries Beatriz de Estrada. As part of her dowry, she gives Francisco rights to one of the wealthiest areas on the continent. He has married very well, but this is not the type of conquest he came for. The most promising new land yet to be conquered is to the north of Mexico. As Coronado is getting married, Spaniards are getting their first hints of what is up there. Conquistadors hunting for Indians to make into slaves in northern Mexico are stunned to find a Spaniard and an African traveling on foot 
out of the mysterious north. They are two of the four survivors from the lost Spanish expedition of Panfilo de Narvaez, which had set out eight years earlier with over 600 people. The Panfilo de Narvaez expedition was the most colossal failure. They landed on the west coast of what we know as the state of Flora today without really any certainty about where they had landed. Narvez men comes under attack more and more by the natives. They're being harassed. There's losses, there's disease, supplies are running out. The Spaniards kill and eat their own horses and use their hides and sinews to build five boats. Their aim at this point was simply survival. Stragglers came on shore, and very soon, of those 250 men, it was a question of something less than 50. The survivors are enslaved by Mariames and Iguazes Indians near what is now Galveston, Texas. Everybody ultimately dies except for Cabeza de Baca and three other companions of his. With him were two other Spanish cavaliers, plus the slave of one, Esteban. Eventually, they convince the Indians that they are holy men with powers to heal. Their lot improves. After seven years, they escape. They walk for 10 months west and south into Mexico. They encounter some 25 tribes in their journey who give them gifts and provide guides to lead them to Spanish territory. I reached four Christians on horseback who experienced great shock upon seeing me so strangely dressed and in a company of Indians. They remained looking at me for a long time, so astonished that they neither spoke to me or managed to ask me anything. I told them to take me to the captain. The governor received us very well and gave us some clothes, which I was unable to wear for many days, nor were we able to sleep except on the ground. At the governor's residence, Cabeza de Vaca begins to tell stories that will launch the conquest of the Southwest. Throughout that land were there mountains, so great signs of gold, copper, iron and other metals. That land is without a doubt the best land in these Indies. Cabeza de Vaca clearly gave to understand that there was great wealth to be found in the area that he had himself traversed. But what they brought back was hearsay information compounded immediately by the wishful thinking of those with whom they had conversation and passed it on to others. One of those who hears the stories is 28-year-old Francisco Vasquez de Coronado. He now makes plans to use his wife's wealth and his connection to the Viceroy to lead the greatest expedition of conquest ever launched. In 1536, four survivors of a failed Spanish expedition escape into Mexico with stories of great wealth to the north in the American Southwest. We found samples of gold. By means of signs, we asked the Indians where those had come from. Now Cabeza de Vaca and his companions pass on stories they heard from the Indians to the Mexican Viceroy. Vasquez de Coronado was a rising star among the uh, Viceroy's entourage. Very far away from there, there was a province in which there was much gold. Someone will need to go north and check out these stories. But none of the Spaniards is willing to return to the place they spent eight years escaping. They said, no, thank you. I'm not going back up there at all. No one was willing to do it, to be sent forth. So the obvious thing to do was to send the slave. 
the survivor Esteban, originally from Northern Africa. Early the next year, Esteban departs for the north accompanied by Indian allies, warriors from central Mexico. The fall of the Aztec Empire, to some extent, had been carried out by the Spanish in alliance with people from a city-state called Tlaxcala. Now, even some Aztecs have become allies of the Spanish in further conquests. They saw themselves very much as partners in this uh, project. This scouting trip is under the command of a controversial Franciscan friar, Marcos de Niza, about 43 years old. He has come to the New World not for gold, but to save souls. Esteban and Friar Marcos travel together for about a month. Then Esteban is sent to scout ahead. He goes about 375 miles into what is now New Mexico, Zuni territory. When Esteban threatens the Zunis that, unless they do what he says, they will be invaded and enslaved by a horde of white men, they turn hostile. A Mexican Indian warrior makes it south down the long trail and tells Friar Marcos the news. Esteban located a great city, only to be killed by the Zuni Indians who lived there. I did not fear losing my life, as much as not being able to give information about the grandness of the land to the north, where God our Lord could be served so much. Friar Marcos returns five months after he left and spreads the word. Marcos sees a, or claims to, anyway to see a city in the distance, and he comes back and reports that. The stories Friar Marcos tells seem too good to be true. As it appeared to me from a hill, where I position myself in order to view it, it is grander than Mexico City. Even one such grand city would be worth conquering, but Friar Marcos tells of seven cities. This reminds the Spanish of seven Portuguese cities whose entire populations took to the sea to escape Muslim invaders in the 8th century. According to this legend, they sailed out into the ocean to some unknown land, settled it, and they remained there. Stories tell of seven new cities in a land where the sand is made of gold dust. The other seven cities are like this one. It's more larger. Now it seems that those legendary seven cities of gold have been found in the American Southwest. All these people are thinking, those are the seven rich cities, and we're going to go up there and find them. Just months after Friar Marcos returns, an expedition prepares to depart. Over a 1,000 Mexican Indians and some 330 Spaniards, each of whom has put up his own money. Vazquez de Coronado has put up his wife's property as collateral and borrowed 71,000 silver pesos to help supply this expedition. A typical laborer might earn 100 silver pesos in a year, but would need to invest about 1,000. The woman named Francisca de Oces came along with her husband, Alonso Sanchez, who was a former shoemaker in Mexico City. The two of them had decided that this was their hope for a prosperous life for themselves. You picture them on horses with their swords drawn, but yet they're really businessmen. There were 11 captains in the expedition. These were certainly men who were inured to pretty violent behavior. And they bring with them a few men who also had been living on the frontier for a decade or more. In their opinion, Indians could be very, very dangerous. Hit them if they don't, if they don't cooperate. Hit them.
two days into the journey, Vasquez de Coronado delivers instructions from the Viceroy and the King. No profanity, blasphemy, gambling, no sleeping with native women, or stealing from the natives we might encounter will be tolerated. This mission is Christian and apostolic, and not a butchery. And all Indians must be treated as if they are Spaniards. The king issued directive after directive, mandating fair and benign treatment of the native peoples of the New World. It's easy to sit in Madrid or Toledo and make laws. It's quite another thing in the midst of a large a population of hostile or resistant Indians. Within weeks after departing, the expedition is already short on food. Some 10 or 12 of our horses died from exhaustion because they had been carrying heavy loads and eating little. They could not endure the labor. Coronado has not brought enough food for this trip. He expects Indians along the trail to help supply his army. After traveling 100 miles, Spaniards look for food in a village of Opita Indians. They will meet resistance. The first armed confrontation of the journey. Three weeks after Vasquez de Coronado's expedition heads north for the seven cities of gold, Spanish soldiers scrounge food from local Indians. Coronado's second in command, Lope de Samaniego, runs to the aid of a captured crossbowman. The Opeta warriors have set a trap. The arrow enters his brain. The others escape to spread the word. Vasquez de Coronado will not let the killing of his second in command go unpunished. Francisco de Coronado and his captains in the province of Giametla, without justification or cause in the least legitimate, seized eight men and women, more or less, and had some of them hung and the rest quartered. Two captains who had left in advance of the main expedition to scout ahead return. They spent five months traveling more than 500 miles to the area where Friar Marcos had said seven golden cities would be located. They were turned back by rugged mountains and bad weather without finding anything. They could not corroborate what Marcos had said. It was very discouraging news for Vasis y Cornello to hear that. The word leaked out, and there was considerable unrest among members of the expedition, thinking that they were being led in a wild goose chase. Don't hurry. What you will see to the north will be good. I saw it with my own eyes. Vasquez de Coronado forges ahead with a small fighting force. For 19 weeks, the advance guard walks north to what is now the state of New Mexico, a distance of over 700 miles. Vasquez de Coronado has named a new second in command, Garcia Lopez de Cardenas. Together, they lead their men to a place the Spaniards call Cibola, which they believe is one of the fabled seven cities. As soon as I arrived to the inside of the Pueblo, I sent Maestro de Campo, Don Garcia Lopez de Cárdenas, a friar, and our scribe, Fernando Bermejo, some distance ahead so that the Indians might see them. 
some Zuni warriors come out of their Pueblo and warn the enemy not to come closer. The requerimiento was made intelligible to the natives of that land through an interpreter. If you acknowledge the church as lord and superior of the universe and world, and the sovereign pontiff called the Pope in its name, and if you allow these religious fathers to preach and make known to you what was stated above, his majesty and I, in his name, will receive you with complete affection and charity. They were given orders to read it three times in the presence of a priest and a scribe. And it basically said, we have come here by God's will and by the Pope's will to conquer you and to bring Christianity to you. Now you have a choice. If, however, you do not do what I ask or you maliciously delay doing it, I will make war against you everywhere and in any way I can. I will take your wives and children and I will make them as slaves. Now, the fact that this was sometimes read to them in languages that they couldn't understand caused Father Las Casas, one of the great Spanish critics of the conquest, to say he didn't know whether the Mercadormento should make him laugh or should make him cry. A Sunni chief draws a line with sacred cornmeal and warns the Spaniards not to cross it. I declare that the deaths and injuries that occur as a result of this would be your fault, and not his magic. The natives reply that they were not familiar with his majesty, nor that they want to be a subject, or serve him, or any other Christian. 80 Spaniards with Mexican Indian allies attack 300 Pueblo warriors. Spanish horses are weapons of war, trained to trample their enemies. Many times I've tried to put myself in the place of seeing this for the first time and never having seen a horse before. You might think it would be a monster who would devour you. The Indians fall back to make their stand inside the Pueblo. I ordered the musketeers and crossbowmen to drive back the enemy from the defenses. I attacked the wall at a place where they told me a movable ladder was leaning. Because my armor was gilded and shiny, all the Indians assaulted me. Vasquez de Coronado is injured. His second in command and captain of artillery act as human shields. Now they're all pinned down by the enemy. General Vasquez de Coronado has reached Cibola, believed to be one of the fabled seven cities of gold. He is badly wounded by the Zunis while trying to take the Pueblo. I think that if Don Garcia Lopez de Cárdenas had not come to my help by placing his own body above mine, I should have been in much greater danger than I was. The Indians soon run out of arrows and rocks. By the pleasure of God, these Indians surrendered, and their city was taken. A sufficient supply of corn was found there to relieve our necessities. The Spanish took over the Pueblo, took the foodstuffs that were available, you know, and that was really the only treasure that they found, you know, in uh, the so-called seven cities of gold. There is no precious metal or any marketable commodity for the Spaniards in Zuni Pueblo even though Friar Marcos had said it would be grander than Mexico City. Marcos de Nisa reported what he had heard from many people along his route, but he told what he thought was a little white lie. 
I think, that he had actually seen it. Friar, everything is the reverse of what you have said. Everybody's pretty angry at Marcos. In fact, he's in very grave danger of being killed. I mean, this may be a, you know, a fun thing for you to do, but we have all spent money to do this, and you have just led us up here to a little stone town. He simply turned around and went back to Mexico City without ever offering even any defense. I think his whole motivation was to convert the Indians so that the second coming of Christ could come. And he knew it was going to require military force for him to have access to the people who he thought he then could convert. For the next two weeks, Francisco Vazquez de Coronado recovers his health at Cibola and plans his next move. During this time, Indians from another pueblo called Sicuique, about 180 miles to the east, come to make peace. One of these visitors has an unusual mustache. The Spaniards call him Whiskers. Coronado writes a letter to be sent by courier back to Viceroy Mendoza in Mexico City. I have determined to dispatch parties throughout the whole area to obtain information about everything and to suffer every disaster before abandoning this enterprise. Vasquez de Coronado sends out scouting parties. Second in command, Lopez de Cardenas and others explore west to the Hopi Pueblos and beyond, trying to find some way to recoup the cost of the expedition. Captain Hernando de Alvarado is sent east with whiskers. He introduces the Spaniards to various Pueblo tribes along the Rio Grande in northern New Mexico. On this trek is a professional soldier, Juan Troyano. He will later be called to testify about Spanish cruelty. Hernando de Alvarado said that he wanted to explore on beyond. And he asked Whiskers to go with him to show him the land. Whiskers said he was tired but that he would provide another guide. The new guide is a Plains Indian being kept as a slave by Whiskers. The Spaniards give this man a nickname, the Turk. The Turk is apparently from the tribe of the Pawnees. The Pawnees wore a form of headdress which was reminiscent to the Spanish of a Turkish turban, and hence they called him the Turk. The Turk leads the Spaniards east, closer to Kansas, his own homeland. The Spaniards have heard about huge, long-haired cows roaming in grasslands to the east, buffalo. Perhaps those can be sold for profit. But there is always hope for something easier and more valuable. The Cornell expedition would everywhere they would have a little gold and say, have you ever seen any of this and where? And finally, this guy they called the Turk, El Turco, said, yes, I have, I have a whole bracelet of that, but those people in Pecos took it from me. Whiskers and the cacique, they have acted as peacemakers. Now it seems these two might be hiding something. The Turk said that Whiskers and the cacique had a gold bracelet and all their things. Whiskers and the cacique denied it. When Vasquez de Coronado rejoins his scouting parties at the Rio Grande, he learns of this new hope for gold. Friar Juan de Padilla told me that it was very important for His Majesty's service that the wealthy land that the Turk told of be learned about with certainty, that this could be learned from whiskers. And they say, so what about this gold bracelet? And he says, I don't know anything about a gold bracelet. I don't have it. He never had it. I never took it. Since Francisco Vasquez saw that one Indian said one thing and the other said another, he ordered them to set the dogs on whiskers. Vasquez de Coronado's personal assistant, Juan de Contreras, will also testify against him. 
I was always personally with Francisco Vázquez because I was his head groom. I always lived and ate in his house and slept at the entrance of his tent. I saw Hernando Alvarado sit dogs and whiskers three times. I saw he was bitten severely and I was present when this occurred. This was done by order of Francisco Vázquez de Coronado and in his presence. Some settlers, like Francisca de Hoses, will later say Coronado went too far. I was in the camp where all this occurred. I did not see Francisco Vázquez give the order, but I believe it's certain that he did so. There were things that were done by the Coronado expedition that were considered to be beyond the bounds. So that is what led to the investigation of the Coronado expedition. Vázquez Coronado's usual defense was, I didn't authorize it. I wouldn't have authorized it. He wasn't responsible for the heinous things that were done under his command. A number of soldiers and Indian allies complained that they did not have clothing and were dying of cold. So I ordered Garcia Lopez de Cárdenas to take trade goods and purchase from the pueblos robes and hides with which to clothe and save our people. He said that he paid for everything. Unfortunately, the Indians may not have wanted to sell, period, at any price. Maybe they didn't want beads right now. It is widely known that soldiers from Don Garcia Lopez de Cardenas took clothing and blankets without the natives' permission. One also seized an Indian woman with whom it was said had sexual relations. It's wrong. It's least they know with me. A few days later, the Indians rose up in arms the Indians killed 50 or 60 horses and pack animals. The Spaniards spend the winter of 1540 quelling the rebellion and driving Indians from their pueblos along the Rio Grande. Some Indians barricade themselves inside their homes. Sieges went on for months. I mean, the Spanish burnt pueblos down. Um, they would trap them inside and try to starve them to death. Hundreds of Indians and dozens of Spaniards die at one pueblo called Arena. Finally, the Indians show a sign of surrender that they think the Spaniards will respect. The Spaniards respond in kind. Then, Don Garcia Lopez de Cardenas makes prisoners of the Indians who have surrendered. Francisco Vázquez de Coronado told me to hurry with a message to Don Garcia Lopez de Cardenas. I was to tell Don Garcia to wait before executing some Indians who would come to offer peace. Wait until the Indian called the Turk could be brought there so he could witness the execution that was to be carried out. The Spaniards want to scare the Turk into helping them find gold. Setting posts in the ground, we began to tie some of the Indians in order to burn them. The Turk was brought so that he might witness the burnings. When the Indians who remained in the tent saw this, they began to defend themselves with poles that were there and stakes that they pulled up because they expected us to do to them as we were doing to their companions. The Christians killed some of them by lancing them and stabbing them. The rest they burned alive. that they wanted Indians to fear them. That is said in several places in the documents. They wanted the word to spread that this was how the Spaniards would behave if you crossed them. This is how we treat people who lie to us.
By spring of 1541, after months of war, the Pueblo Rebellion has been suppressed. The Spaniards have new cause for optimism. The Indian called Turk said, by means of signs, that he would lead us to large settlements and also to gold and silver. This place was called Kivira. El Turco said, there are seven cities further east that are wealthy, they eat off gold plates and they have gold hanging from trees. It just played right into the same mythology again. After 14 months and a thousand miles on the trail, Vasquez de Coronado has one last hope to find gold. It will mean pushing even farther into no man's land, towards the point of no return. Vasquez de Coronado has spent almost a year and a half trying to find the seven cities of gold. For the last three months, he has been following the Indian guide he calls the Turk toward a place called Kivira. The fact of the matter is they proceed through the Great Plains for weeks, and what they see is uh, a lot of uh, small Indian villages and a whole lot of grass. It's a scary place because it's so flat, you cannot see any feature. If, if it was a cloudy day, you really literally don't know what direction is what. So they're all anxious. Some 1,300 miles from home, General Vazquez de Coronado finally arrives in the region of the Kaviran Indians. The only metal he finds is a piece of copper, worthless to the Spaniards. Vasquez de Coronado is only sure of one thing. His guide, the Turk, has deceived him. Did you order the Indian called the Turk to be killed? Who ordered the killing and for what reason was it done? And were you present in the camp when the Turk was garroted? When the Turk is seen giving a hand signal to kill, his fate is sealed. So then they take the Turk, they start to torture him. He admits to the lies. He admits that he had been put up by the Indians back in the Pueblo region to lead the Spanish off into the wilderness to die. And the whole hope was that the Spaniards would go so far out into the prairie, their horses would die, and they'd be helpless. I ordered Diego Lopez and Juan de Zaldivar to administer justice. Vasquez de Coronado and his men return to New Mexico, where they spend the winter. Misfortune follows Coronado. He fell off his horse and re-injured himself with a head, another head injury that they almost thought he would die from. And he held a council, and his captains agreed. Yes, we should go back home and we shouldn't leave anyone here. They would probably be killed. The only people that were allowed were priests, only because they are operating under their own jurisdiction. And two of them stayed, one in Pecos, and one went out to Kansas, both of whom died. Those who wanted to remain behind amounted to more than 60 persons, including myself and my husband. But Francisco Vasquez restrained us and threatened that he would hang us if we stayed behind, or even talked anymore about staying. Francisca and Alonso were immediately subject to debt collection and poverty on return to Mexico City.
Just a few months after Vázquez de Coronado and his followers start their long walk south into Mexico, another expedition is sailing north in the Pacific Ocean. Juan Rodríguez Cabrillo. He fought as a young crossbowman with Cortés to defeat the Aztecs. He will become the last victim of the Coronado expedition while looking for an island called California. There were stories that came in that there was a, a ruler up there who was very wealthy and that this island of California was a great source of pearls. And so Cabrillo was sent on an expedition in 1542 to take a look and see if this was true. Cabrillo and his men become the first Europeans to lay eyes on the coast of what is now the state of California. This entire region is heavily populated by Chumash and other Indian tribes. They already know not to trust the Spanish visitors. They had heard about people like Cabrillo, people who had beards, light skin, who had been in this place called Cibola and had fought with the natives there. There were probably very few native people in North America who did not know something about what happened with the Pueblos and with the Coronado expedition. These guys uh, weren't exactly gentlemen, and he finally exacerbated the Indians out in San Miguel Island to the point where they killed him. Two years later, Vázquez de Coronado was put on trial for cruelty to the Pueblo Indians. And the Spanish wrestled mightily with the problem of uh, whether it was uh, legitimate to compel people uh, to the true faith, or whether that activity had to be carried out only by peaceful means. No other European nation struggled in the same way, maybe because the Spanish did it first. Vázquez de Coronado and 17 other witnesses will give testimony. After three and a half years of deliberation, he is cleared of all charges. Coronado himself never was punished, nor did anyone deny these things had happened. They just said they were justified. Only one member of the expedition is held responsible, Vázquez de Coronado's second-in-command, García López de Cárdenas. He spent some time in jail in Spain and paid, paid a fine for it, but not much, not for what they did. Probably the greatest consequence of the Coronado expedition is the realization that there's no readily exploitable wealth and interest in settlement and further exploration basically ends at that point up until the beginning of the 17th century and no further conquest, no further exploration to speak of. And so where do the, uh, the conquests take the longest? They take the longest in places like the American Southwest. What was there to attract them? Uh, there were other opportunities in other places uh, that they found far more attractive than they did the harsh environment and the lack of either exploitable mineral resources or labor uh, that was available in the uh, southwestern United States. It will be 57 years after Vázquez de Coronado before a small Spanish settlement is finally established in New Mexico. And it will be 240 years after Cabrillo before more Spaniards come to settle California. Thus, one of the first areas in the United States to be explored is one of the last to be conquered, the American Southwest.